Okay, welcome everybody to another uh, installment of the One World Colloquium series. I'm Stephen Lewandowski. I'm the chair of the Communications Committee of the Psychonomic Society. My job today is to introduce uh, our team and the speaker, and also to make an announcement for starters, and that is that the Psychonomic Society is currently accepting proposals for the 2023 Collaborative uh, Symposium, which will take place in January at the University College in London. And this is in conjunction with the January meeting of the British Experimental Psychology Society. And there's funding available, and there's a link uh, where you can apply. And that link and the information has just shown up in the chat. So please have a look at that. Okay, and now um, I'll introduce Beatrice, whom many of you may know from previous occasions. Beatrice is at the University of Mannheim, and she will be moderating the Q&A uh, session at the end. And if you have any questions at any time, please put them into the Q&A facility, not the chat, but the Q&A throughout the talk. And that is what Beatrice is going to monitor. And that is um, how she will uh, manage the discussion at the end. So use the Q&A at any time. And now my main task is to introduce the speaker gives me great pleasure to introduce Karen Schloss. Uh, Karen is currently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, by way of background, she got her BA from Barnard College at Columbia and her PhD from Berkeley. Uh, she completed her PhD in 2011. Her advisor was Stephen Palmer. And then she stayed on as the postdoc at Berkeley for another two years. Now, at the moment, currently, she runs the Visual Reasoning Lab at Madison, which studies how people interpret meaning from visual features. And as part of that, she's also developing educational tools in virtual reality. She's received the Early Career Award from the Psychonomic Society in 2021, so just last year and an NSF Career Award in 2020. So uh, without further ado, Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, does that look okay on your end? Excellent. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here to um, share this work with you and to have a lively discussion during the Q&A Afterwards. And so the title of my talk is That Color Means What? Understanding How People Infer Meaning from Visual Features for Visual Communication. Now, I want to start with the um, idea that visual communication is really fundamental to how humans share information. So for example, we create maps to inform others about perilous weather patterns, about environmental trends, and even how to navigate a new city. We create diagrams to teach others about um, mathematical processes and biological processes. We create graphs to illustrate patterns of disease progressions. And we create signs to help people navigate their way through an airport or figure out where to discard trash versus um, recyclables on their way to their gate. Now, in all of these cases, observers are using visual features like color, shape, size, texture, and orientation to learn about the world around them. But the question is, how can we use squiggles on a map to figure out which way is home? Or different shapes in a circular format to learn about the life cycle of a ladybug? Or different orientations and heights of rectangles to learn about the trajectory of coronavirus cases? Um, or colors to know where to um, discard recyclables? And this brings us to the general question that motivates much of my work, which is how do people infer meaning from visual features and use those inferences to make judgments about the world? Now, to address this question, it's helpful to think about visual communication as a general problem of information transmission, where we have a designer 
who encodes messages in a visualization. In this case, it's a visualization about carbon emissions. Now, when we think of the word designer, many people might think of designer with a capital D, someone who has a graphic design degree and is designing um, for um, professional publications. But I really want to democratize the idea of who a designer is. A designer can be anyone. So academics, anytime we make slides like these, we're designers. Business people um, are making graphs of financial trends and what business people do. Middle schoolers are presenting data from their middle school science fair projects. They're all designers. So when we're talking about the tasks of designers, this involves all of us. Okay, so a designer encodes messages in visualizations and observers receive messages from the visualization. Now notice that messages are on both sides of this system. And ideally these messages will be equal. That will be a successful communication if the observer is receiving the message that was encoded by the designer. Now there's lots of processes that are involved in, in observers' um, interpretations of visualizations that influence the message they receive. Um, first and foremost, Observers have to be able to perceive and identify important features in the visualization. So for example, they have to be able to distinguish between different shades of red in this map to know that they mean different things. Secondly, um, they have to be able to map features onto the concepts they represent. So figuring out what the different lightnesses mean in terms of carbon emissions um, in this map. Um, and third, having established these mappings, um, they then need to consider implications of their observations. So seeing, say, that North America is very dark red, what does this mean for how we should interact with the world um, and possibly try to reduce carbon emissions? Okay, so these um, are three main types of processes that are involved. Um, and for now, I'm going to focus on the second one, mapping features onto the concepts they represent, because that's the main focus of my lab. Now, when you look at visualizations like this, you might be thinking, well, you can just figure out the mapping by reading the legend. So just looking at it, reading what it says, and then going from there. Um, often visualizations don't have legends. Um, and even if they do, people have expectations about how visual features map onto concepts. And those expectations influence their interpretations. So the general question is, what is the nature of these expectations that people bring when they approach a visualization? And if we can understand those expectations, we can create designs that align with those expectations and therefore facilitate communication. Okay, so in previous work, most of the focus has been on the first and third step and has overlooked the second and the second step. So mapping features onto the concepts they represent. So why might there be this oversight where people have overlooked this um, as an important area to study? And I think it's because there's a general assumption that expectations about mappings between visual features and concepts are limited to two main kinds of cases, cases of resemblance and cases of structure preservation. So in resemblance, um, features in the visualization appear similar to that which they represent. So in this, um, in this plot on the right, um, this is fictitious data about fruit sales. And we've got banana coated in a yellowish green, blueberries coated in blue. Um, and so we're getting um, resemblance between the colors of the bars and the objects that those bars are referring to. Now, this is all well and good if you're plotting data about concrete objects that resemblance is relevant, but it's limited to visualizations about concepts with observable properties. So if you think that um, these inferred, inferred mappings matter just for resemblance, then you would think that the case where they matter is really limited. Okay, so that's resemblance. Um, another um, factor that can influence people's inferences about mappings is structure preservation. And the idea here is that structural relations between features, so say gradations of likeness, correspond to structural relations between that which they represent. So here we're looking at a color map, um, if this is um, a correlation matrix, and we've got gradations of color are mapping onto gradations of quantity, in this case, um, correlation. This is a structure preserving mapping because increasing values of color correspond to increasing values of, of lightness. We could turn, sorry, increasing values of quantity. We could turn this color scale upside down and switch the mapping. Both of these would be structure preserving. But if we were to scramble the color scale, then this wouldn't be structure preserving anymore because now we don't have gradations of color corresponding to gradations of quantity. Okay, this is all well and good and important, um, but it's limited to visualizations where there are where there is structure in the concepts to preserve, which is not always the case. Okay, so 
In my work, I suggest that color is far more robust for communication than previously thought because people can infer meaning from color in cases where there's no resemblance and no structural relations among concepts to preserve. So throughout the talk, I'll make, be making the argument for this, but I'm just gonna give you a demo right now to make sure that this is super concrete. So let's say you've got this bar graph here representing data about safety, comfort, sleeping, and driving, um, but the bars are not labeled yet. And so your task is to figure out which bar color um, goes with each of the, um, these different concepts. And so um, I don't know if we're able to do um, a chat so people can see. I'm gonna try this. And if this works out that you can see people's responses, Awesome, and if it doesn't, we'll pretend that it did and I'll tell you how it works when we have live audience. So if you can type into something, <laughs> um, indicate if you think that the bar color for comfort is bar A versus bar B. I can see a chat. Yay, okay, we're getting responses. We got one, awesome. I love audience participation on Zoom. Yes, okay, so we've got most people are responding with Barbie, some are with Bar A. It's also nice to see who's here, hello everyone. <laughs> okay, and so in this case, the comfort, the concept of comfort, there's no directly observable properties of comfort like there is for say blueberry and banana, yet most of you chose Barbie. There's also no structure in these concepts to preserve, but again, most of you chose Barbie. So this is a case where there's clear consistent inferences um, that cannot be explained by um, resemblance or preservation alone. Okay. So if we actually underestimate people's ability to infer meaning from color, this can actually be pretty problematic. And um, firstly, it can lead to missed opportunities to leverage color for communication. So it can lead to opportunities where we could have used color to help communication and we didn't but also it can lead to misleading mappings that impede communication. So if we just do, think we're doing arbitrary assignments between colors and concepts, but they're not actually arbitrary, people did have expectations and our visualizations violate people's expectations that can impede processing. Okay. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is give you a brief overview of um, my research program through what I call the color inference framework. And then we will dive into specific questions that I will address um, in this talk. And I have a little asterisk there by color because I originally developed, or I have been developing this framework with respect to color, um, but it should generalize to any kind of perceptual feature. And that's an open question for future work. Okay, so the idea of the color inference framework is that as we're moving about the world, we're continually forming associations between colors and concepts. And so this is what I call a color concept association space. And the thickness of the bars in this particular plot um, represent the association between each color and the concept watermelon. And so as we're moving through the world and experiencing more and more watermelons, um, we are updating this plot as we go. Um, and the idea is that um, although we can do this for concrete objects, it's possible we can do this for abstract concepts as well. So as we're, um, as we're experiencing the world, we're, just for, we're continually updating these associations. Okay, so these associations can be represented or stored in what I call a color concept association network. And this network connects all colors to all possible concepts. And thinking about associations this way allows us to think about different operations that can be done on this network that lead to different types of judgments. So one type of operation is a pooling operation. So imagine we've got this red color here and we've got all the concepts that are associated with that color. Um, we can then have properties of those concepts, say how much we like those concepts, and those get pooled onto a summary, which then leads to preferences for colors. Um, I'm not gonna talk about color preferences today, but there's a lot of work that um, we've done on the ecological valence theory, largely in collaboration with Steve Palmer, um, which has understood color preferences um, as this kind of pooling um, type of operation. Okay. Another um, type of operation that we can do on the color concept association network is assigning. And this is relevant for interpreting colors in information visualizations. Um, and we'll talk about this work today in the context of global assignment theory. Now, going into this work, I kind of took color concept associations for granted. There are these things that we have and I focused on how we actually use them. Currently in my lab, um, we've been working on trying to understand the nature of these associations and how they're formed with experience and how they change with context. Um, but we're gonna put a pin in that for this talk, but just know that there's really interesting um, questions to be addressed there. 
And for the remainder of this talk, we're going to be talking about assigning um, interpreting colors in the context of global assignment theory. Okay, so the, we're going to work on three main questions today. So the first question is what determines people's inferred mappings between visual features and concepts? And to address that question, I'm going to introduce um, two concepts, so assignment inference and global assignment theory. Having established those, we're then going to ask why are there limitations on people's ability to use assignment inference to interpret visualizations? And in addressing that question, we're going to introduce the idea of semantic discriminability. And having defined that, we're finally going to ask what determines the ability to produce semantically discriminable colors for a set of concepts. And to address that, I'm going to introduce semantic discriminability theory. Before diving into the details, I want to emphasize that this is interdisciplinary work with interdisciplinary collaborators. Um, so much of this work has been with Laurent Lassard, who's in electrical and computer engineering, and he's um, helped bring in a lot of the optimization ideas into this work. Um, and a lot has also been done with undergraduates, which I want to highlight here as well. Um, developing um, global assignment theory has been in collaboration with Kevin Landy in philosophy at York University. Um, also, this work was with more undergraduates. Um, and then in developing semantic discriminability, um, Kishan Mukherjee has taken the lead on, on that work. And he's a graduate student in my lab right now. Okay. So what determines people's inferred mappings between visual features and concepts? To address this question, I'm going to introduce the assignment inference paradigm. So let's say you've got two bins um, and you know that um, on some trials, you have trash to discard. And on other trials, you have paper to discard. So let's use the chat again and type, um, if you think trash should go in the left or the right bin, you can type an L or an R, left L for left and R for right. Great, okay. So we've got lots of answers for right. Now let's look at another example. Remember, sometimes you've got trash, sometimes you've got paper. Um, but here we still have trash. So do um, you think trash goes in the left bin or the right bin? Okay, so this is more mixed, um, but we're getting lots of laps. Okay, so this is what the task was like where the trials were randomly um, mixed in for trash and paper. Um, so we had two concepts, paper or trash. People saw all pairwise combinations of six, uh, um, six possible, um, sorry, so six pairwise combinations of four possible colors. Um, white, which is the color most strongly associated with paper, which was established from other participants. Um, this dark yellow color, which was most strongly associated with trash. And then red and purple, which were very weakly associated with um, both paper and with trash. So they saw 12 repetitions of um, these conditions, which were left right balanced for which color um, was on the left or the right side of the bin pair with 144 trials within subject. And the question is, in this kind of task, what determines inferred mappings? What determines how you're picking which um, one of these colors? Okay, um, so we'll start out just by um, discounting the structure preservation hypothesis for this because there's no structure here to preserve. So structure preservation says that you basically would be a chance if that was the only thing that mattered. Um, but I can tell you people are not a chance, so we can say that that's not relevant um, for this particular type of task. Okay, so our first real viable hypothesis is the local assignment hypothesis, where you'll choose the color that is most strongly associated with the target object. And we can think of this like resemblance. Okay, so to walk through this hypothesis, we're going to be looking at this bipartite graph. Now, we're going to be using these graphs throughout the entire talk. So please stay, like, come with me right now to really focus on how we're going to explain that, uh, use these because we're going to use it throughout. So I want to make sure we're really clear on what this is representing. So we've got two concepts, trash T and paper P, and we've got two colors, this dark yellow color and white. The edges connecting the concepts with the colors represent the association strength, where thicker edges mean stronger associations. The numbers on the edges are also representing association strength, which can go from zero to one, and those data were collected from different participants. Um, these edges are independent, so there's no, they, they don't have to sum to one or anything like that. These are based on just association strengths between a single concept and a single color. Okay, so a local assignment, we say, Let's ignore paper, it's not relevant on this particular trial and just look at trash. And then which color is more associated with trash? It would be the dark yellow color. So trash should go in the dark yellow bit. Looking at this example here, ignore paper, not relevant right now. We don't have to worry about it. Um, trash is more strongly associated with white. And so that says that trash should go in the white bin. Okay, 
If we were to look at um, plots of predictions of this count, um, here we're plotting the predicted proportion of times people will choose each color for the target being trash versus paper. Um, and so for the dark yellow and white case, trash should go in the yellow bin, paper should go in the white bin. And according to local assignment, um, trash should go in the white bin and paper should go in the white bin because we're just treating each child independently. And undergraduates coming into the lab for a research experiment, we thought this is really what they might do. They don't need to take into account anything else to complete the task. Okay, um, and an alternative though is global assignment. And the idea here is you choose the color that maximizes association strength across all color concept pairs. So it's taking into account the entire system. And you would do this even if the association is weak. And what this does is this accounts for the non-target that's not necessary to consider on this particular trial, but it's relevant to the encoding system as a whole. So just think through this, we can look at one possible assignment, which is the outer edges. So trash with yellow and paper with white. And we can pair that to the other possible assignment, the inner edges. So trash with white and paper with yellow. We can sum them and say the outer edges have a bigger sum than the inner edges. 1.8 is greater than 0.5. So that means trash should go in the yellow bin, paper should go in the white bin. And this is consistent with what local predicted here. But we can dissociate local and global in this purple and white case. So if we sum the outer edges, 1.1 is greater than 0.5. So that says that trash should go in the purple bin, even though purple was the color that was most weakly associated with trash in isolation. So if we look at the predictions for what would happen here um, for the yellow and white case, that should be just like what we saw before. But now this predicts that trash should seriously go in the purple bin and paper should go in the white bin. So what do people do? Here I'm just um, bringing our simuli over here. This is the local prediction I showed you and the global prediction I showed you just for reference. And now we'll take a look at participant responses. And we can see that they match the global predictions. And if we look at model fits, we can see that both local and global assignment models um, do um, correlate with our data, um, but global assignment is a much better fit with a correlation of 0.999, sorry, yeah, 0.99. So, um, it looks like people are doing global assignments. This is the more complicated way to approach this task, but it's the more globally consistent in the context of an entire encoding system. Okay, um, so th this brings us to assignment inference, which is what people were doing in that task. An assignment inference is the process by which people infer mappings between visual features and concepts. And as I mentioned earlier, you can think of this as an assigning operation on this color concept association network to interpret the meanings of colors. Now. Assignment inference is analogous to assignment problems in optimization. And assignment problems in optimization are really standard models that are used to assign items in one set of things to another set in a manner that optimizes something called merit of the pairs. Or you can think of merit as the goodness of the assignments. So a classic example of this in optimization is let's say you've got four trucks, truck one, two, three, and four. You've got four different routes, route one, two, three, and four. And your goal is to minimize the amount of miles traversed by the trucks. And so an assignment problem can be used to figure out what the way, what, how we can do that to optimize the assignments. Um, and in this case, the merit so the numbers that go on these edges would be the mile. So how long it takes for say truck one to traverse each of the four routes. Now, what can happen is that a truck can be assigned to a route that is not its fastest route in isolation because that's better for the system as a whole. So that should bring to mind what we talked about with associations a moment ago, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so one type of merit is miles. Another type of merit um, is fuel use if you're trying to minimize emissions. So depending on what you're trying to optimize, you would put different numbers on these edges um, to, to make the most efficient or best system. Okay, so bringing this back to visualizations then, we've got our two concepts, trash and purple, uh, tra trash and paper and our two colors. Um, and our goal is to maximize interpretability. But the question is, what is merit in assignment inference? When people are doing this task, what are they using as merit when they're doing this optimization? Okay. And so this is gonna be the big question that we're gonna be interested in asking. So this brings us to um, global assignment theory. And the idea is that inferred mappings for any type of visualization, not just recycling bins, um, can be framed as a problem of assignment inference computed over merit. And once merit is well-defined, once we know what, what numbers to put on those edges, then predicting people's inferences should be straightforward using our models of assignment inference. But the big question is what determines merit in assignment inference? So 
So to address this question, we're going to go back to the recycling domain. Um, and, and I had mentioned earlier that a different set of people had given their color concept association ratings. Um, so what those people had done is they had seen um, concept words written at the top of the screen with each color from this set of colors here. Um, and the concepts were recycling related. So paper, plastic, glass, metal, compost, and trash. And their task was to rate how much they associated each color with each concept on this sliding scale from not at all to very much. Um, below here is just an example of um, what the data looked like from paper, and they're just sorted from low to high. So we can see that some colors are super associated with paper, some colors not at all associated with paper, and other ones are in between. Okay, so that was the data we started off with. And then we use those data to create different types of color concept assignments with different types of merit. And our strategy here was to test, to test different types of encodings with different definitions of merit, and then see what was easiest for people to interpret. So whichever ones are easiest for people to interpret, that tells us about the type of merit that people are using in assignment inference. So we set out um, to do this experiment, but then we were faced with an initial problem, and that's there's extensive many-to-one and one-to-many mappings. So if we look at the concepts paper, plastic, and glass, we can see that the top associates, the top associated colors for those are basically all the same. And if we look at for metal, compost, and trash, especially compost and trash, the top associates are basically the same. So starting out, we were curious if this was even possible. So we had this idea of trying different types of merit and then seeing which was easiest to interpret, but it might not have been possible at all to even to, to create palettes that people could interpret. So that was kind of the underlying question of, can we even do this? Okay. So going back to our question, um, which type of merit is easiest to interpret? We tried two different definitions of merit. The first one is that merit for a given concept and color is just equal to the association strength for that concept and color. So with this definition of merit, we figured out what the optimal palette would be. Um, and so here we're looking at our concepts, paper, plastic, glass, metal, compost, and trash, and the colors from the optimal palette going across the top. And this matrix is showing the association strength between each concept and each color, where the diagonal represents the concepts and colors that were assigned to one another. And we can see the diagonal is very dark because um, these colors and concepts have strong associations. So darker means stronger associations. But you can also see that the off diagonal is also really dark. So concepts are strongly associated with colors that they weren't assigned to. We see that up here um, and down here. And that's because, as I mentioned, the top associates for the concepts paper, plastic, and glass are very similar to each other. And same for compost and trash. Okay, um, so we, then tried a different type of merit, um, which is association difference. So now the merit for an assignment between a given concept and color is the association strength for that concept and color minus the next best association strength. And so what that does is it avoids confusability. So it means that you might not pick the strongest associate, but it will pick a color that is differentiates between that color and concept versus all of the other ones. Okay, so this is what that color palette looks like. And we can see that the diagonal is lighter, meaning that the association strengths are not as strong on the diagonal as they were up here. So the concepts are not assigned to strongly associated colors. But we can also see that the off diagonal is also lighter, meaning that there might be less confusability. And if we take a look at um, plastic with the saturated red color, we can see saturated red is weakly associated with all of our concepts, but it's a little more associated with plastic than the other ones. And so there might be enough signal there that people can still figure out what color um, goes that, with plastic and then it's this red one that's actually very weakly associated when there are more strongly associated colors in the palette. Okay, so now let's take a look at what people um, do. So here we're looking at the proportion of times that each um, color was chosen. Um, the target object is written at the bottom of the plot. So paper, plastic, glass, metal, compost, and trash. And the arrow will be pointing up at the correct answer according to the optimization. So the globally optimal solution. Okay, so um, for both types of merit, um, white was the correct answer um, and people did fine. Um, for, the, um, for plastic, when we had association strength as merit, people were confused. So they were more likely to pick the blue than they were the correct answer, which was the gray. But they are able to get red, even though red is weakly associated with plastic and they're more strongly associated colors with plastic on the screen. Um, for glass, they're super confused up here. They're getting it right for the association difference. 
Metal is the same color for both and they do fine. And then for compost and uh, trash, again, we see they're getting it confused up here, but they get it right when we use the association difference. Um, and so the results show that association difference is easier to interpret. So that suggests that when we're trying to model assignment inference, association difference is the type of merit we wanna be considering. That's what we think that people are doing at least more so than association strength when they're trying to find out mappings between colors and concepts. Okay. So returning back to global assignment um, theory, which this is the slide I presented earlier, I mentioned the challenge is what determines merit in assignment inference. And we know at least for um, categorical um, visualizations where we got different categories of, of concepts, paper, glass and trash and so on, um, merit is association difference. Or at least that's our best estimate of merit at this point. But we can look at other types of visualizations. So what about color map data visualizations, where instead of different categories of objects, we're mapping gradations of color to gradations of quantity. Um, evidence suggests there's a lot of factors that go into merit there. So structure preservation, as well as various biases, like dark is more biased, opaque is more biased, hot spot is more biased, and association difference. I'm not gonna go into the details of these in this particular talk, but I'm happy to talk about them in questions if you're interested. Um, but you might be thinking, well, okay, we've got association difference is um, merit over here. It might be relevant here, but there's all of these other things. If merit is different for every different kind of visualization, then we're not going to get much mileage from this type of theory. But the good news is that merit transcends types of visualizations. So we've also done work on Venn diagrams, which are completely different type of visualizations from color maps that are mapping quantities to colors. Um, yet we find different types of uh, merit transcends and it applies to Venn diagrams as well. So that suggests that global assignment theory will help us make generalizable principles um, to understand and for mappings. Okay. So we've addressed our first question, what determines people's inferred mappings between visual features and concepts. We're now going to ask why there's limitations on people's ability to use assignment inference to interpret visualizations. To address this question, we're going to introduce the idea of semantic discriminability. Semantic discriminability is the ability to infer a unique mapping between features and concepts based on those features and concepts alone. I will walk you through that. But in the context of thinking about it, we can think about it um, compared with perceptual discriminability. So you can think of perceptual discriminability is the ability to tell the difference between two colors, say. Semantic discriminability is the ability to tell the difference between two colors, not in terms of their appearance, but rather in terms of their meaning. So let's say we've got um, two concepts, uh, watermelon W and mango M. And we can bring back our bipartite, our, our bipartite graph um, where we've got the association strength between water and melon and mango and our two colors here. Now, if we look at our two possible assignments, we can say that the outer assignment has much greater merit than the inner assignment. And that would be the case even if we added noise. Now, why are we talking about adding noise? Well, when you solve an assignment problem in optimization, it's just optimizing over the numbers that are on the edges, whatever those numbers are. And so it says it's, it's deterministic. You're either gonna have this assignment or this assignment. Humans aren't, don't work that way. So humans have noise. And if you ask the same person to do um, these trials over and over again, there'll be some build, a variability in their responses. Um, and if you ask multiple people, um, you'll get some variability in responses. So the data from these kinds of um, tasks are not just zero and one. So we can think about that by thinking about adding noise to the edges. So there's um, variability. So if we were to add noise to these particular edges, so perturb merit, the merit is so different between the outer edges and the inner edges that you basically would get the same solution all the time. So this is what we call a robust assignment. This has high semantic discriminability, meaning that over and over again, if I asked you which color was mango and which color was watermelon, you would probably come up with the same solution. And many of you would come up with the same solution as each other. We can quantify semantic discriminability with a metric called semantic distance. I'm not going to go into the details of how we calculate that here, but generally it's an estimate of semantic discriminability that's computed using color concept associations. Okay. Um, so in this case, our semantic distance, which can go from zero to one is 0.97. So zero means no semantic discriminability, one means perfect semantic discriminability. So these colors have high semantic discriminability. We can contrast these with another case um, where we've got this red and green. Now, the outer assignment does have larger merit than the inner assignment if we were to sum these weights, but it only has slightly greater merit. And if we were to add noise, it can flip. 
So if we were just to perturb these, these um, merits just a little bit, you could end up with flips so that the outer sum isn't the better one, it's the inner one. Okay. So for example, these two um, edges are so similar, you could get um, flips in which is this, which is more merit, and then you could then switch which is the optimal assignment. Okay, um, so here we have a lower semantic distance, and this is what we call a fragile assignment because it's more subject to change with noise. So these two colors have lower semantic discriminability. It's harder to tell them apart in terms of their meaning, even though perceptually they're highly discriminable. Okay, so our question then is, does semantic distance, this measure um, of, of semantic discriminability, predict people's ability to interpret visualizations to come up with the optimal solutions? So to address this question, um, we use a task very similar to the recycling one, but we switched it to bar graphs instead of recycling bins. So participants were presented with bar graphs about fruit, um, and their task was to indicate which color um, corresponds to this particular fruit. Um, there was no legend, and so what was correct when we were scoring the data was determined by the optimal solution to an assignment problem. Okay, the colors that we used um, were these eight colors and we selected them because of their association properties. So four of the colors were um, somewhat associated with mango in decreasing order and then um, four were not associated with mango. And then those four that were not associated with mango were associated with watermelon. And then the ones that were associated with mango are not associated with watermelon. This is a useful properties to help us um, vary semantic distance in a way I'll show you um, on the next slide. Okay, um, the de design included two targets, so watermelon or mango randomly interspersed, and there were 28 color pairs for all pairwise combinations of these colors. We left right balanced the positions of the colors. We left, um, we balanced the relative bar heights, which one was higher, that was um, just randomly perturbed. Um, we also um, had three repetitions of these conditions, which led to 672 trials um, within subjects. Okay, so what we wanna do um, with these association data that I'm showing here is calculate semantic distances and then see if they predict interpretability. So these semantic distances um, look like this. So we've got semantic distance on the y-axis where zero means no semantic distance. You can't tell the colors apart in terms of meaning and one is high semantic distance. So you should be able to tell the colors apart in terms of meaning. Those are the color concept associations just to remind you what it looks like. We've got our mango colors here and our watermelon colors over here. So looking at M1, so this orange color, this is what the semantic distances look like for these. Um, and this is what the trials um, would have looked like. And so we can see that when um, this M1, this mango color is paired with the strong watermelon color, there's high semantic distance. And really semantic distance is pretty high for a while until we start pairing mango colors with mango colors and then semantic distance starts to fall off. So that's um, M1, M2, the rest of the data. This is the pattern that we want to try to see if our um, human data match these semantic distances. Okay, so we're gonna put the semantic distances over here. I'm also gonna show you the perceptual distances. So here, this is just the perceptual distance in Delta E and CIE LAB space, which is asking how different the colors are. Um, and overall, these were uncorrelated. And so we designed um, this experiment this way so that we could test for independent effects of semantic distance and perceptual distance when they're not correlated with each other. So now we'll take a look at the data. Um, so these are the data for mango and for watermelon. And we can look to see just through a glance that they um, seem to match the semantic distance data and not the perceptual distance data. Um, we used a mixed effect model that included semantic distance um, as well as perceptual distance and we found that semantic distance was a significant predictor I and mean, in this particular data set perceptual distance was not. So what this tells us is that semantic discriminability where we've operationalized it as semantic distance predicts interpretability. It predicts people's ability to um, infer the optimal mapping in the, um, in the encoding system. Okay, so now that we have this notion of semantic distance and semantic discriminability, um, we can move on to um, our main final question. So what determines the ability to even produce semantically discriminable colors for a set of concepts? When can we do this? And when is it a lost cause that we can actually create for semantically discriminable features? Okay, so earlier work suggested that color semantics is really limited to what were called colorable concepts. Um, and I like to think about this in terms of specificity. So here we have 
the concept banana. And these different bars are representing the association strength between each of these colors and the concept banana. Um, banana was previously considered a highly colorable concept. And you can think about that as it having high specificity, meaning that there's some colors that are really strongly associated with bananas and some colors that are not at all associated with bananas. And we can contrast this with another concept like safety, which has lower specificity and was previously called non-colorable. So safety is a more uniform distribution over um, the different colors um, in this particular set. So it's less peaky. There's not like any colors that are super strongly associated with safety and other colors that are super not associated with safety. Okay, so in previous work, um, there um, have been so colorable concepts like fruits and vegetables and concepts that were considered non colorable like properties and activities. So working leisure, sleeping and efficiency. These also are more abstract over here, though, um, the notion of colorability versus non colorability doesn't necessarily fall on the lines of, of abstract versus concrete. Okay, now the problem with this view is it treats concepts in isolation. So it says that your ability to meaningfully encode a concept in color depends on properties of that concept in isolation without considering the relative associations that we know determine semantic discriminability, which influences interpretability. So um, to walk you through why um, this is a problem, let's take a look here. So we've got two um, bars of fictitious data. Um, and for concepts A and B. And let's say that concept B is strongly associated with this pink color and not at all associated with this orange color. And concept A is similarly weakly associated with both. Okay. If we were to calculate the semantic distance, the sum of the outer edges is way bigger than the sum of the inner edges. So this has high semantic distance, even though concept A is weak, equally weak, so associated with both of these colors. Now let's say that concept A and concept B um, have these distributions over a color library, where a color library is just a sampling of colors over color space. So not only is concept A equally associated with orange color and this pinkish color, concept A is associated equally with all colors. So from the perspective of colorability, this would be a completely non-colorable concept because it's similarly associated with all the colors. Concept B though is peaky, so it has high specificity. So it's strongly associated with this pinkish color um, or pinkish purplish color and then kind of falls off um, in this other part of the space. Importantly, the ordering of these colors is not important for the types of metrics we're gonna be using. So we chose metrics that are agnostic to ordering and they just happen to be sorted with respect to different dimensions in um, CIU space right now. Um, but this is, that's not important for what we're gonna be talking about here. Okay, so we've got a uniformly distributed concept and a peaky one. What we can do is calculate the semantic distance for all pairwise combinations of colors and ask what the maximum semantic distances we can get. And so here, although a lot of the color pairs have zero semantic distance, there's some that have semantic distance close to one. So this one has a semantic distance of 0.98. And so we define this maximum as the capacity for semantic discriminability. It's the ability um, or the extent to which it's possible to produce semantically discriminable features for a set of concepts. So what we suggest is that these um, two concepts, concept A and B, have high capacity for semantic discriminability, even though one of the concepts, concept A, is uniformly associated with all of the colors. Okay. So this brings us to semantic discriminability theory, which is a theory about the capacity. So the capacity to produce semantically discriminable perceptual features for a set of concepts is going to depend on the difference in the feature concept association distributions, so those distributions over colors, independent of specificity alone. So let's walk through this. So here we've got two concepts, peach and celery. Both of them have um, high specificity, but they also have very different distributions. And so if we look at the, just the semantic distances we can get for all pairwise combinations of colors, we can see there's a really high max capacity, or high capacity, high maximum semantic distance. Now let's take two concepts that were previously considered non-colorable. Both of them have not super peaky distributions. They're not um, very specific, um, but they have a medium distribution difference using a metric I'll talk about in a moment. So they have a medium difference, dif medium difference in distribution and so they actually have a medium capacity for semantic discriminability, even though neither one of them is, has a high specificity. Then we can look at two concepts that are super specific, like eggplant and grape. So there's very clear colors that are associated with eggplant and grape and that are colors that are not associated with these concepts. But they're basically 
the same distributions. There's a very small distribution difference. So now these two concepts previously considered colorable when put together are gonna have low capacity for semantic discriminability. Okay, so how do we test these ideas? We began um, by collecting data on color concept associations similar to the ways I've told you before. So we show people concept names at the top of the screen uh, with colors and people rate the association strength on a scale from not at all to very much. We tested four different categories of concepts. So fruits, vegetables, properties, and activities. So participants um, were divided by groups. So all, um, one group of participants judged all of the different fruits, vegetables, properties, and activities. So that way um, there were just fewer trials for any one group. Um, in the, within a group, the concepts were randomized for a given participant. And these concepts are from Lynn et al. from previous work. The colors um, were the UW71 colors, um, which are primarily uniformly sampled over CAELAB space with an extra plane at the lightness level to be at the high lightness level and um, to be able to get good yellows and greens that we couldn't get from the uniform sampling. Okay, so let's quantify our measures. So our dependent measure um, that we're trying to predict is capacity. So the max, um, max semantic distance we can get for a set of concepts. And we computed this capacity for all pairwise combinations of the 20 concepts I showed you before. So that's, we're computing the most semantically discriminable pair we can get and asking what its semantic distance is. And we're trying to predict that from two independent measures. The first one is mean specificity. So how peaky the distributions are. And we quantified that using entropy. Um, so here we've got the banana and safety distributions. Now I just sorted them so you can see how peaky they are. So banana is um, super peaky, high specificity and safety is not so peaky, so lower specificity. This is a property of concepts in isolation. And then we just averaged over the concepts to get the mean specificity of the concepts within the set. Um, Okay, so that's one of our measures. And then the other one is distribution difference. So this is uh, measuring how different our two distributions are for the sets of concepts. And this was quantified using total variation. And the idea here um, is it just goes, does point wise comparisons and sums them up. So we can look at the difference between say this yellow color, um, this greenish color and so on. And that gives us the difference in the distributions. This is a property of concepts in the context of a concept set. So whereas specificity is about concepts in isolation, this is a property of concepts within their set. Um, right now, I'm going to be focusing on just two colors and concepts. Um, in this study, we also looked at four colors and concepts. We found similar results, and this approach should generalize to n concepts and colors. Okay. So it turns out distribution difference does predict capacity. So here, we're going to be looking at the correlation between the maximum capacity for each pair of concepts, so say banana and peach, apple and celery, and all, all possible combinations of concepts, um, as a function of the distribution difference. And we see there's a super strong correlation. So the degree to which you can produce semantically discriminable colors for a set of concepts depends on the distribution difference between those concepts. We compare this with um, specificity, and we find there is a strong correlation there as well. But when you put both of these into a model together, distribution difference was a significant predictor and specificity was not. So the variance that's going on is, is captured by specificity is also being swallowed by distribution difference. Okay, so now we've established that our ability to produce semantically discriminable color palettes for a set of concepts depends on distribution difference and not just properties of the concepts in isolation. This has important implications for interpretability. The idea is that if a concept set um, has this high capacity, then we can encode concepts with colors that people can interpret. But interpretability is going to depend on semantic discriminability within that set. So to study this, um, we use trials that um, I introduced at the very beginning of the, the talk. So let's say you've got these four concepts, sleeping, safety, comfort, and driving. Participants were asked to drag the concept labels to the colors on the graph um, like this. Now in this experiment, we showed eight concept sets to a particular um, group of participants um, with eight repetitions within each set where we varied the colors, the positions of the bars and also the heights of the bars. Um, and so this led to 64 trials um, within groups, within participants. Um, but we did have two groups of participants to avoid um, having a ton of trials for this type of task done online. Um, and so that can be kind of treated as um, just a, a repetition of the same design. Okay, 
So what this meant was that each concept set, or each concept appeared in four different sets. So for example, sleeping appeared with driving grape and banana. It also appeared with driving peach and cherry and driving safety and comfort and so on. And so what we can do is we can look at if the ability to interpret which color goes with sleep depends on, so this exact same concept depends on the semantic discriminability within the set. So if there's variability in the ability to do this with sleep across these different sets, can we understand that in terms of semantic discriminability? Um, when we generated um, these color palettes, um, we used it using solutions to an assignment problem with the maximum association difference that I introduced to you early on. So we wanted to create palettes that were as interpretable as possible given what we know about interpretability. Okay, um, so these are examples of three um, different um, trials in the experiment. So this trial has all high specificity, so corn, carrot, peach, and celery. Um, this one has high and low specificity, so we've got celery and eggplant, which are high specificity, and speed and efficiency, which are low. And this has all low specificity, so sleep, driving, comfort, and safety. And remember from previous work, these concepts were considered non-colorable. We can simulate the responses we expect to get um, based on our models of semantic discriminability. Um, and the idea are, is that the arrow is pointing up at the predicted best response. And so we can see in all three of these cases, um, the model um, is suggesting that people will get the correct response, even for the case where all the concepts have low specificity. Uh, now let's look at participant responses for these cases, and we can see that they strongly match. So here I'm only showing you um, three concept sets, but over the full set of concept sets, the correlation between the predictions and or the simulations and the data is 0.95. So using our models of semantic distance, we're able to capture um, people's responses. Now, if we look at the um, each one of the correct answers, we can define a, a metric called semantic contrast. And we can think of this as semantic distance for a single color. So normally when we talk about semantic distance, it's the distance between, um, let's say two colors or a set of colors. But we can talk about semantic contrast, which is the distance between that color and all the other colors in the palette in terms of semantics. And our question is, does semantic contrast predict interpretability within a single concept? So when we've got variability interpretability for a single concept, can we understand that in terms of semantic contrast? Um, and it turns out we can. So let's first take a look at banana, which has high specificity. And we're gonna look at the mean proportion of correct responses um, for just for banana um, as a function of semantic contrast. So one means it's high semantic discriminability for this particular color within the set and zero means low. And so we can see that there is variability in people's accuracy. So sometimes they're really good at banana, sometimes they're not. Um, and that is predicted by semantic contrast. And if we take a look at the case where they're super good, this is a case where we've got eggplant, celery, grape, and banana. None of these concepts are competing for yellow with banana. When they're not so good is when we include corn. So now corn is competing for yellow with banana. So there's less semantic contrast for this particular color, this yellow color in the set. Okay, we can look at this also for sleeping. So a previously considered non-colorable concept. So now we can look at sleeping and we see some variability again in how accurate people are with sleeping. Sometimes they're pretty good, sometimes they're closer to chance. So this is a case where they're pretty good about it, um, where the correct answer for sleeping is black and there's low competition with the other colors. They're not so good here when there's lower semantic discriminability in the set, so there's more competition among the colors. And so um, what this is saying then is that for a given concept, your ability to accurately map it onto a color where accuracy is determined by the optimal assignment, your ability to do that is going to depend on the other concepts and colors in the set. So context really matters here in a way that we can predict through our models. And this is just to show you the full data set and we can see um, these um, consistent trends um, where um, accuracy increases with semantic contrast. Um, and a mixed effect logistic regression model shows that semantic contrast is a significant predictor. Um, specificity is too, but critically, semantic contrast is an independent predictor. So we have to take that into account, the context, and not just the concepts in isolation. Okay, so to summarize um, this particular um, last question, we ask what determines the ability to produce semantically discriminable colors for a set of concepts? And we find that different distribution difference constrains the ability to produce semantically discriminable colors and greater semantic discriminability um, leads to greater interpretability. So here context matters. 
So finally, I will conclude um, by going back to the original claim that color is far more robust for communication than previously thought. And the evidence for this is that people can infer meaning from color in cases where there is no resemblance and no structural relations among concepts preserved, even for concepts that were previously considered non-colorable. And this capacity arises through our ability to do assignment inference, which produces stable and predictable judgments as long as colors are semantically discriminable. And this work leads to testable hypotheses about how these findings can extend beyond color to other types of visual features and features in other perceptual modalities. So finally, um, this work addresses the fundamental question of how people infer meaning from visual features, and it can be translated to, visual, to make visual communication more effective and efficient. So I would like to um, acknowledge my collaborators and funding sources and other people who provided valuable contributions to this work. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take lots of questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Karen, for this inspiring talk and lots of pretty colors, <laughs> all, all sorts of meanings. So. <laughs> We can open um, the discussion now. Um, you can post questions to the Q&A box. You can also use the raise your hand button, um, uh, button that you have on the bottom of your screen if, if, and then I can unmute you so you can um, speak to Karen directly. Um, and we have a first question in the Q&A box. Um, it's about whether there have been similar studies with people who are blind or visually impaired or colorblind. So I, I don't know if you can cover all these together or we'll go one by one. All right, this is a super great question. Um, so firstly, um, th these particular kinds of studies have been done with people with typical color vision. Um, people who are um, color deficient, so say a dichromat, we should find the same kinds of um, results um, in terms of assignment inference. So the idea with this is that if we know what people, if people have some color discriminability, if we know what their associations are, then we can use that as input into our models and we'll predict the interpretability. Now, if two colors appear the same to them, then they two colors that appear the same won't be able to communicate different meaning. Um, so if we collected data on associations from dichromats, then we should be able to predict their, their responses. Um, for people who are actually, who don't have color vision at all, who are, who are blind, there's evidence um, from other lines of work um, that people have um, color concept associations, um, even if they're not sighted. So through language, through hearing about the way other people talk about, um, about colors, and um, it's evidence also suggests um, it might be through language corpus, is uh, cor corpi, corpora. Corpora, um, Gary Lupion in, in my department here has done some work on this, looking at um, people who are blind um, and the associations that, that they have. And they do have systematic associations, which means that if we were to describe a visualization um, in words, then they would potentially have the same kinds of assignment inference um, outcomes than we would, as we would see for um, sighted individuals. But these are really interesting open questions. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I also, I was wondering about synesthesia. I'm not sure is that the correct term in English? So is that just other associations then or how would, how would that fit in? Or have you, have you examined these in your, in your research? Yeah, so people with synesthesia have um, spontaneous perceptual um, experiences with, with things in one domain and another. So they might map colors to numbers or music or there's a, very large set of, of types of synesthetic experiences people can have. Um, the same kind of answer goes though. So for a synesthete, um, they may have different associations between colors and concepts than possibly an average observer who's a non-synesthete because of their strong um, perceptual experiences. And if we knew what their associations were, then we would be able to predict their inferences as well. Um, but when they are going to interpret visualizations, they could end up having conflicts between their kind of perceptual experiences through synesthesia, as well as these kind of um, semantic associations. And if there were conflicts, then you could end up with confusion. So I think um, it's a super interesting question that's worth studying, um, but we should be able to understand it within this framework. Yeah, it, it, it seems like it's just, it's a hard group to get, I guess. I mean, any, any of the ones we talked about now are hard to recruit. <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question from Jillian Anderson, who's asking when comparing different topics, vegetables, sleep, driving, etc., 
Were the four topics given in a set of four pre-picked colors or were they given with a color scale where the participants could pick themselves? So those, I'll go back to that slide. Okay, so um, what we did is we, def we first, we pre-picked sets of concepts and we did it so that we had cases where there, each concept always appeared with a buddy. So sleeping and driving within um, always appeared together. So there would be one aspect of the context that's consistent. Um, and then we had cases where they got paired with concepts that were similar in terms of specificity or different. So we had cases where they all had relatively high or previously called colorable. They were previously called non-colorable and then mixed sets. Once we had our set of concepts, um, which we balanced carefully um, across conditions, the question is, how do you pick the colors to go with those concepts? And the colors we chose here, we did using, um, we selected using the, the mass association merit function that I showed in the recycling case. So we wanted to use the set of colors that would be as interpretable as possible, um, given what we know about how people do these interpretations. Does that answer the question? Uh, but, but critically, this all came from data. So the associations came from data from other subjects. So we used those association ratings to pick the optimal assignments to then give to the other group of participants. And do you know in the association ratings, do they give distinct colors or do they have like a color wheel where you adjust it yourself? Ah, so for the association tasks, they look like, they look like this where each color is paired with every possible concept. So we have, for these 71 colors, there's an independent rating for each possible concept. Okay, great, thank you. And um, there's another anonymous question. Um, do, or does color association differ across nations and cultures? Yes, so there's gonna be individual differences, or there's gonna be cultural differences in these associations to the extent that people have different kinds of experiences with color. So um, for me, I'm at UW-Madison. And so if you ask me to associate colors with university, our color is red, I'm gonna have a strong association with university, university and, and red. I was at Berkeley for many years before where you couldn't see red on campus because our rivals were Stanford and everything was all about blue. <laughs> and so then I probably had different associations then. That's kind of a cartoonish sort of example to say that our experience in the world are going to shape our associations. Now, the idea here is that we've got these associations from a lot of people and average them. So any idiosyncrasies in these associations are going to get washed out. So we get some signal in the noise. So if we all had different associations, then we would there would be uniform distributions. Um, and so then the idea is if we know what these associations are for a given culture, then we know what their inferences will be. If we went to, a, so I collected these data in the US, um, we could have very different associations in another culture, um, especially for the more abstract concepts without directly observable properties. Um, and there's open questions about understanding the nature of these associations in the first place. But the idea is that if we know what the associations are for that particular culture, and that culture does assign inference as our participants are doing, then we should be able to predict their interpretations. So it's a matter of adjust, of measuring what we need for the input into the model to be able to then predict the output. I was just thinking about maybe maybe you know this project, the small world of words, where they assess semantic associations across different languages, and so they and they use the same methodology and give the same keywords. So I wonder if are there any efforts in the color association to to do something like this, so to ask this apple and the different colors pairings in in, in many different nations, or maybe we should set it up. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, there has been a lot of cross-cultural work with emotion terms and color words. Um, the issue, though, is, is that when we're talking about associations and trying to pick these fine-grained differences, at least for visualizations, we want to collect data with colored patches as opposed to colored words. Because there's also differences in what colors people think of. And there's differences in color, um, basic color terms across cultures and what the prototypical colors are for different cultures. Um, so to, to do that study, we would want to be able to um, collect data in associations between color patches and, and words. Um, one thing that we have thought about doing in our group and some others have done in the past is try to use that kind of semantic space through words to then 
estimate the associations um, between colors and concepts. So if we know about the semantic similarity of words, then do they have similar color associations? The issue though um, becomes apparent with things like fruit. So fruit are highly semantically similar, but their color associations are very, very different. And so that then becomes a problem for trying to use only a language-based semantic network to be able to um, estimate these associations. Um, what we have done though, um, so Christian Mukherjee um, is the lead author on um, this new work that we're doing also with Tim Rogers and Laurent Rossard and uh, Michael Gleischer. And what we're doing is trying to create color concept association based spaces. So you put two concepts near each other in the space when they have similar color concept associations. And it turns out we can do that. It's a, a, a six dimensional space. Um, we can characterize the dimensions using um, metrics of color concept, so, um, uh, sorry, metrics of in, from color spaces. So we can well characterize these dimensions. And what that means is that when you know what that space looks like, and then you take a new concept and you put it into that space just with a few colors, you'll be able to estimate the associations for all of the other colors. Then the question becomes, does the nature of that space differ for different cultures? Or can we use that same space and say, okay, this is what the, the space looks like. These are what the dimensions are, but this same concept lives in, a, in that space in a different place than for one culture than it does for another culture. And so that's um, ongoing work that I'm super excited um, to write up soon and share with the world. Um, but for now, um, it seems like it's working. And there's, I think, a lot of leverage to use that to really understand the nature of these color concept associations and to be able to study them in a robust way across cultures. Oh, very, very interesting, yes. <laughs> OK, so currently, there are no questions posted. I'm not sure anyone has a question. Again, you can also raise your hand. And, um, Ask it directly if you prefer. Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it's such a clear talk. <laughs> And I think we touched the, the big questions and lots of ideas for future studies. And we look forward to, to seeing your work come out on this. Um, so thank you again so much, Karen, for this inspiring talk. It's been, I really, really enjoyed it. It was, it, it was fun and I, I, can, I can feel your excitement and that's, I'm excited now too. I think I'll switch to color research. <laughs> um, well, thank and, you so much for having me and thank you for these wonderful questions. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to um, make sure everyone is aware that um, the next One World um, Cognitive Psychology Seminar will be on May 18th, um, and it will be with Helen Fisher from the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, Germany, and she will speak about a metacognitive perspective on politicized science, and I posted the link, the registration will open this afternoon um, so that you can get your ticket and hopefully we'll see you on May 18th. Um, and starting to get some thank yous in the, in the chat, Karen. So yeah, thank you for this very, very interesting talk. We really, really enjoyed it. All right, thank you everyone.